Hi, this is Laura Lee Griffin. And this is Nikki May with the Stardust Society, inspiring you to stop getting in your own way and start building an art biz and life that you love. We are artists who believe strongly in the power of community, accountability, following your intuition, taking small, actionable steps, and breaking down the barriers of fear and procrastination that keep you stuck. Follow along with us on our creative business journey as we encourage you on yours. Today, we're speaking with Elizabeth Shawakert a mixed media artist based in Montana with a passion for travel, ink, and encaustic painting, and who creates insanely cool brushes and tools for artists. Elizabeth, welcome to the Stardust Society. Thank you so much, Laura and Nikki. I'm so happy to be here. We're so excited to have you here, and we want to get you started the way we start everybody out. We want to hear your Stardust story. I know that, like Laura and myself, you have a background in the corporate world and that you were doing both side by side for quite a while. And in the last, well, you'll have to tell us how many years you've been able to leave the corporate world behind and become a full-time artist. Thank goodness for that. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But yes, I spent 23 plus years working for major corporations and uh, at positions at the executive level towards the last 10 years of my career um, in product and brand development. And I worked with customers uh, in the U.S. and also overseas. My last job, I was working for the largest retailer in Taiwan as the executive vice president of marketing and product design. And prior to that, I was a VP for Michaels uh, running design, uh, QA, QC, and uh, brand development. Wow. So it was a lot of years and I, I moved uh, I moved eight times in 16 years, including an overseas. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it was a lot of moving and a lot of change. And um, it was pretty exciting for the first 12 to 15 of those years, for sure. (laughs) (laughs) So I know you and I became acquainted for the first time, I don't remember how many years ago, through the encaustic world, but you were still working. You were working for the company based out of Taiwan, and we did a a little bit of work together for that company. That's right. Yeah. So tell me, were you doing art then? Well, I know you were because we met through encaustic. But have you always been an artist or is it something that you started to get away from the corporate world? How did those work together? Well, I've always been uh, drawing and uh, doing some sort of painting or art, even since we were very young. We come from an Mm -hmm. artistic family with uh, people that were painters and educators and art was always an important part of our lives. Um, Mm -hmm. But I really didn't know that I could be an artist or should be an artist until it was later in life. And I spent probably a good 10 years pining after wanting to do it full time when I was still working. Um, And, you know, as my career sort of developed into that mature phase when you're supposed to be um, super excited about going to work and running big teams and doing a big corporate job, I just was starting to really dislike my life, um, at least my career life. So I, I can 100% relate to that (laughs) after, (laughs) after a decade with IBM. Yes, (laughs) absolutely. So how did you manage balancing the two juggling the two? Well, if you ask my partner, um, she would say that I didn't balance it for a long time because I worked, you know, 12 (laughs) hours a day and then Um, on the weekends, I would get up like at 5 a.m. and get up into the to the uh, studio so that I could paint for maybe five hours uh, on the weekends and then, um, you know, go to work during the week and just dream about uh, painting and making things and wishing that I could do that. Um, It's not not to say that there was no joy in my work, but it just didn't feel um, it was, mis- I was missing something. It just felt like it was not satisfying to me and I did not feel fulfilled. And I knew really deep down I needed to make a change, but it's a very difficult change to move into an art career when you have an established. Oh your- yeah. I mean, I have two kids and a, f- a house and <laughs> you have to pay the bills. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I happen to know that your partner also is an artist. She that's, does that's ceramics. Right. 
And so was she doing that full time while you were working the corporate job or did she also have a a job job? Um, she's an RN. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. So uh, she's always worked part time wherever we've lived, but she was the primary caretaker for our kids. All right. Um, I have a son and daughter. They're both pretty much grown up now or trying to grow up. And uh, <laughs> well, we're, we're all still trying to grow up, yeah. aren't we? We are. And <laughs> maybe trying not to. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, she still does some work, but um, is definitely doing uh, pottery on a more full-time basis. And that's a piece of our business that we're still working on developing for sure. Yeah, actually, I'd love to hear more about that because the collaborations that you two do together are just beautiful. I held up the tumbler I got from you guys that I'm drinking from. And I know that, so she does beautiful ceramics. Absolutely. And then you paint them. Yeah. And it's, it's really wild because, um, you know, I've always been an abstract artist and I don't have uh, an art degree. So I am a, I'm not academically trained, but I, and I didn't really know that I could paint as well as I can. And it's kind of Mm -hmm. funny um, (laughs) how you can kind of discover things. And uh, we just, you know, she's been making pottery now for probably about six or seven years. And I don't know how we started doing, how I started painting on the pots, but I just remember wanting to try. I was like, oh, that looks cool. I want to try that, you know, (laughs) put some underglaze on. (laughs) You've done some beautiful work on her pots. I yeah. I just showed Laura, I think yesterday, um, a beautiful big plate with a dragon on it. Mm-hmm. And then this this cup that I have has dragonflies. So clearly you can do more than just abstract. I mean, your abstract work is also beautiful, but thank you. Yeah. What you're doing together is beautiful too. And um So that's one part of your business, but tell us all the other things you do, because I know you do a wide variety of things. Well, lately it feels like all I do is make brushes 24 seven because (laughs) it's just been uh, so busy. Mm -hmm. And like most people, you know, I don't have enough time to do some of my more creative work that I'd like to do, but it's funny because you can't, you can never predict where life will take you. And Mm -hmm. if, if someone had told me that I was going to be you know, really making a living, uh, making Sumi style contemporary brushes and, you know, silicone tools and, you know, inventing mark making tools and things like that. <laughs> I would have been like, what? Are what you crazy? Are you about? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to do that. But, um, but Hey, that's where life has taken me. And, um, I just want you to share with us how that got started. Well, I spent a lot of time in Asia uh, traveling Mm -hmm. for work, um, doing Mm -hmm. sourcing really, uh, for since 2000, I've been traveling to China and, uh, especially when I was working in Taiwan for four years, I was there, uh, for 10 days, every three to four weeks. Um, yeah. And I really got to know the city and the people and the culture. And I got interested in the calligraphy painting and just the whole Mm -hmm. sort of art practices and the philosophy of, a, a lot of the Asian art practices. And w- what happened really is that I was working with one of my favorite brushes and I knew exactly what it was going to do. And I was like, oh, I just need to like mix it up. So <laughs> I, I made a brush and I made this, you know, really sort of beautiful little painting. And I thought, oh, that was really cool. And then I started, I don't even know how I began, but I just started making brushes and you know, I'm a good problem solver. I'm, I'm very good at design. Yeah. Yes, you are. Yeah. But I, I've always been that way. I mean, even in my corporate life, that's something I was always really good at was just problem solving and figuring out how to fix things. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, that's how my mind works. And I just sort of started and I had, uh, created this website and it was completely wrong. I mean, I was selling all this sort of Asian stuff and, And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've completely rebranded it over the last, I think now it's been six years. And yeah, I kind of remember for a while, were you, were you selling things that you had purchased overseas? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh Yeah. I, I was because that. it was helping pay for my art supplies and stuff, you know? Yeah, I get it. <laughs> Whatever helps. We got to pay for those art supplies. That is yeah, right. And, and plus, I'm just, you know, <laughs> by nature, I'm just like a little businessy person, you know? I'm uh-huh. like, ooh, I think I yeah. can make money doing this. And um, and then 
I, I don't know. It just, it just morphed into what it is today. Obviously it's not just random. I, I mean, I, I decided to rebrand and I realized what I needed to do, but when I first started, I didn't have such a clear path. So you started making your own brushes because y- you were bored with the ones you found out there. Yes. Yes. And how did that grow? Well, I started making brushes and then artists started talking to me about, oh, I, I want one of those. Will you make me one? And so I realized mm-hmm. that, first of all, I was good at it. You know, I mean, I could yeah. I could do it. But they're so beautiful. Thank you. Well, they've gotten so much better. I have to get my paws on one. And the only reason <laughs> I haven't, the only reason I haven't yet is because they're all so amazing. I can't decide. <laughs> And they're well, all different you. sizes. I think that's cool because you've made some really large ones as well as small ones that I've oh, seen. Oh, yeah. So, so the business now just is really kind of segmented into, I, I tried to kind of focus on developing my Sumi brushes and really making really solid functional tools. And I think the key to anything is, you know, having that clarity of purpose and, and understanding what it is that you need to do and then recognizing those opportunities that come along and taking advantage of them. So, mm-hmm. you know, for me, um, it was recognizing, oh, there's demand for this. It's pretty niche. I like doing it. Um, mm-hmm. And so I just started and there was no rules, no rule book, nobody to show me. I just sort of started doing it. And yeah. And you figure it out as you go along because you exactly. figure out what, what works or what doesn't work or yeah, exactly. And um, even like, you know, working on the website, just figuring out how to put the website together and how to do the product pages and how to do the descriptions and how to set everything up. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's taken me a while, but um, I'm really proud of my website and proud of what I've been able to do with it for someone that has, you know, zero training in that and isn't really technically savvy. I'm just sort of, you know, (laughs) but my background does help with that for sure. Well, I would say clearly with your corporate background and the art, like Laura and myself, you're both left brained and right brain. For sure. I mean, I love and used to really like analytics a lot because I always wanted to figure out the story. You know, what is it Mm -hmm. telling you? And I understand also how to look at analytics and, you know, not that I have time to do it now, but, um, (laughs) but I know, I I know enough to, to know what I need to do and to look at results and to, you know, make good decisions about my business. And, um, especially, and I, and I think too, just the branding, understanding that piece and really working on that, uh, in a very specific way, uh, even with my big, long, name that's unruly and hard to pronounce <laughs> and spell. And and by the way, I have to admit, because I, I like to tell on myself on this podcast, um, I have known you, I mean, we haven't met in person, but I've known you for, I don't know, how many years? Do you know how Ten, many years? Maybe. 10 years, maybe. Mm. And I had to ask you today before we got on how to pronounce your last name. (laughs) So for everybody to know, it's S-C-H-O-W-A-C-H-E-R-T. Yes. So that you can find the website. (laughs) You don't have to remember that because we will link to it in the show notes. (laughs) We will. Perfect. (laughs) Okay, but let's get back. Let's get back to your story. So did you start making the brushes before you ended the corporate Career, uh, yes. Or is or is that what made you, that's what made you able to do it? I started making brushes um, before, and I also started teaching um, workshops and doing a lot of art related business stuff prior to uh, leaving my corporate job. And my last corporate job, I left with a layoff, so that was kind of like a forced leave. Ah, did you get a decent severance package? I got an okay severance package for that. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. That doesn't hurt at all. Yeah. Yep. Um, but, uh, you know, and I thought what I was going to do was do consulting because I just really, really couldn't stand the idea of working for another big retailer or corporation. Right. Which would, re- you know, involve moving my family again. And uh, my son was going to be uh, like a junior in high school. Mm-hmm. And so I embarked on this whole idea of creating this um consulting business. But then I found I had all this time and I really started working really hard on my art business. Nice. Because that's way more fun. 
And Mm -hmm. it really, it really just started to kind of take off. And I sort of realized that, oh, well, maybe I can make this work. And uh, it was always our plan once my son graduated from um, high school to move uh, to Montana and to downsize and everything. So, you know, I didn't, I didn't tell Kim exactly what I was doing and I probably should have, um, but I just really started focusing on it and, um, it just really started coming together. But I have to say that there's so many things involved in this other than just working on the website. I mean, for the last 10 years, I had been working on my social media presence, Mm -hmm. um, on Mm -hmm. Instagram, uh, Facebook, and I started to really work on Pinterest then. Um, cause mm-hmm. I saw that as a way and those things really sort of, uh, set the foundation for being able to do a, a standalone website because y- you have to have traffic, right? Having a beautiful website that nobody knows about yeah. doesn't do you any good. Exactly. And there, and so I had been doing all this stuff th- this whole time and, uh, that really allowed me to to start to really, you know, drive that business a lot more and really start to create something more meaningful. Well, the other thing that you've also been doing alongside that is you have a YouTube channel. Well, yeah, I have a YouTube channel. And I mean, I do get traffic from YouTube. It's really interesting. Uh-huh. Um, and YouTube, it, when people come to uh, my store from YouTube, it's I have a good conversion rate for that. So I kind of did a lot of it when I was doing more encaustic painting, and then I sort of did less of it. And I've recently started to add more videos again to YouTube because I realize that it is a good traffic generator, but also it works really well for me uh, when I want to add an item and have a demo. Uh, It works really great Mm -hmm. just to do a snippet and put that in there. And so it's right there. And if the customer wants to see the brush in action, then they just can hit that snippet. It's on YouTube and they can see it. And so, so you basically embed the video on your website where the product is. Yes. And YouTube makes that really easy and you can even do it privately, but I just do it public because what the heck, I mean, I'll get as many. Why not? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And they're really, they're really short videos. They're not real fancy. I do have a good setup. They're exactly what you need because you make these beautiful brushes that, you know, you look at and there's some small ones and big ones and fat ones and skinny ones. And there's hard bristles and soft bristles. Exactly. What do I do with these beautiful Mm -hmm. brushes? And so just a few, even just a few seconds of showing how to use the brush makes you want to buy that brush. Well, yeah. And and it also just really shows what they can do and that diversity Mm -hmm. of the different mark making. And it's funny because so many people ask me, oh, I could never use that brush. I could never paint with that brush, but they're all totally functional art tools. Nothing that I make is just to be pretty. I mean, there's Mm -hmm. a few brushes that I made. But they are pretty. Yeah. But because it is, um, to me, an artistic practice, you know, I mean, yeah, I would get so bored if I just you know, churned out a bunch of tools that had no personality to them. Mm -hmm. So, um, for me, I'm constantly striving to improve the function of the brush, um, to improve the way that I make them to be efficient, but also to just enhance the visual interest and to take the time to, to work with the materials and, and kind of do what I want with them to a certain degree. So the brushes that you make today, um, are they primarily for like sumi-e, drawing, ink, um, brushes, or or encaustic, or how can people utilize the brushes? They're really, uh, well, they can be utilized in a lot of different ways. And one of the things that I mentioned, I think, earlier was just uh, recognizing opportunities for business expansion. So Mm -hmm. one of the things I realized early on, um, I had taken a course with Paula Roland uh, for... uh, encaustic monotype because I really love encaustic monotype, but there's no tools. I mean, we're using all this stuff from, you know, the bake store. Hardware stores. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So I recognized right away that there was an opportunity and I started working with silicone and thinking, okay, how could I make these tools? And the first tools I started making were pretty primitive. They were cool looking. They worked. Um, but I've really refined that and I've developed like a bunch of different really functional tools that 
create a lot of very interesting mark making and allow for a lot more um, representational or specific type of mark making on uh, Mm -hmm. encaustic monotype. But they also work with acrylic, any kind of gel Mm -hmm. mediums. They work with, I mean, really cold, anything that is going to be moving across the surface in a reductive way, as long as it's not too thick and gooey, you know, it has to have... (laughs) Like some, some printmaking ink and stuff like that for traditional printmaking doesn't work very well for some of the tools, but. Right. It's too thick. Yeah. But for the most part, they, they just do a lot of really interesting type of mark making. And of course that allowed me, I mean, every time I do this, I have this kind of burst of also just artistic creativity and using the tool, looking at what it can do and, um taking advantage of that. But so I, I developed a a big line of encaustic monotype and printmaking tools. I also recognized for cold wax that there really wasn't a lot of tools. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I developed um, specific brushes for cold wax and uh, different. Do you also work with cold wax yourself? I don't. I mean, I don't really, I mean, what I did was I just bought cold wax and I just played around with it. Experimentation. Yeah. And I also know what it is. You know, I've seen it. I've taken a cold wax workshop. I know how the material works. So I know kind of what is needed to do it. Mm-hmm. And then I also sent brushes to Rebecca Crawl and uh, nice. for her to use and, you know, to give me feedback. And I do that quite a bit, actually. I, I do send product to sp- like Paula Roland has a lot of my tools and stuff that I've given mm-hmm. her um, to use in her workshops. And which is a, a perfect way to to test your products, to grow your, you know, your audience exposure. Yeah. Yeah. To get more exposure. Yeah. It's brilliant. And, uh, and so I took advantage of those two opportunities. And then, uh, with regard to my brushes, um, certainly ink is, is a good go-to, but right. You know, depending on the, the type of bristle hair, whether it's coarse, not coarse, uh, if it's deer, I mean, all of those type of bristles will work with different media. And it really just depends on what you're doing, how thick it is, what the coarse or stiffness is of the hair. Um, but people, my customers work with all different kinds of material. And um, I mean, I've sold thousands of brushes. So, uh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And they're all individually handmade by your hands. Every single one. Yeah. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's a brilliant product for you because A, you get to solve a problem of not finding brushes that excite you. So you get to make your own brushes for you to use in your own art. B, the brush itself is a beautiful piece of art. And then you also get to provide other people with beautiful tools that they can use. So, I mean, there's just so many facets to it that I think it's it's beautiful. Lots of win-win happening there. Yeah. And (laughs) and one of the things I really enjoy doing is working with artists uh, and commissioning, you know, specific uh, brushes for their art practice that they want or need. So I do that Ah, a lot. And that's hmm. what I need to do. And it's like, so I'll get, somebody will say, well, I really want, um, something to be able to do X, Y, and Z. And, you know, I'll come up with a design for it and make it. And, and I also make, you know, very large, uh, Sumi style brushes that, you know, you couldn't find anywhere. Um, right. I mean, just this, just this Christmas in the last month, I've sold four and, you know, they're big, really large ones. I mean, I think I saw a picture of you holding one that looked like a broom almost. It was so big. I I sold four, four brushes that size. That's amazing. (laughs) (laughs) I'd love to see what people are producing with those. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, some people, like one of them was for a a guy for his wife to hang up in her studio as a Christmas present. I don't know that that one will be used, but, but yeah, uh, that's, that's always exciting to me to work with an artist. And it's funny because I'm much less excited to work on a commission if I'm doing a painting. I, I really don't enjoy that. But when I'm making art tools, I actually really do enjoy the process of designing the tool to the specification of the artist um, and figuring out how to make it, you know? It's because you're solving a problem and you said that you're a problem solver. So it's yeah. almost like a puzzle that you get to figure out how to get that product exactly the way they want it, you know? Exactly. You get to use all parts of your brain. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so the business has really evolved over the years. And, uh, as I said, what I do probably 
well is just um, recognize those opportunities as they come and just really pursue them. That's fantastic. Yeah. And I think my background in branding, I mean, I understand how to do it. And for example, um, I remember when I first started, I, I was working with Bonnie Leibowitz in Dallas, who... I love Bonnie. Yeah, she's wonderful. And um, she runs the Encaustic Studio, where I've taught many times and still do uh, teach. And we were having a one-on-one session, and I told her, yeah, I'm going to call my website ES Studios. And she said, hmm, I don't think that's a very good idea. I mean who's ES and who's studio? And she, I said, yeah, but my name's Elizabeth Shawakert. And she said, <laughs> <laughs> and she said, okay, well, great. There's not going to be very many people with that name and it's perfect. <laughs> so can't argue yeah. with that. And so I just embraced it and I thought, okay, well then that's what I'm going to do. And thank goodness I didn't waste my time with ES studios and just you know, got that figured out quick. And in fact, you know, I I mean, as I was thinking about this whole interview, that's one of the things that was so helpful to me to spend time with her in the very beginning to just really understand some of the basic stuff that, you know, I I needed to do to, to get off onto the right foot in terms of starting a website. And of course I, you know, you start and restart and, you know, navigate things and realize you have to take, you know, make course corrections and all those things, but right. But it does definitely help to uh, to get that input um, from someone that has that experience, for sure. Yeah, and Bonnie's fantastic. I know her really well as well. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about, we. okay, we've gone all into the brushes, which is amazing. But talk to us about how you combine that aspect of your business with your own art. So I, I've seen a lot lately. Looking at your social media, it's mostly the brushes, but I I also see some um, beautiful artwork on ceramics sneak in and some encaustic monotypes. So how do you juggle slash balance your own art now with the brush making? Well, you know, um, I think it really depends on the time of of year. Like right now, I've been doing nothing pretty much but making brushes 24-7 for the last month and a half. Holiday time. Yep. And, uh, you know, I'm in e-commerce. That's what I do. And you've got to take advantage of the the time of year and you have to be ready for it. But like with anything, I don't have as much time to create art as I would like. Um, I really think it's not just a time thing, too. It's a mental thing. Mm -hmm. You have to be in the right mental space to really focus. And if you're going to do more than just, you know, play around making monotypes or, you know, a a lot of times what will happen for me, especially with monotypes is I make a new tool. And then I have this big, I think I mentioned this, but a big burst of creativity around that tool and what I can do with it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I move on to something else and maybe the next tool comes along. Or if I have a day where I can just say, okay, I'm going to set up my, my, or maybe I'm teaching because I do zoom classes for teaching monotype in caustic painting and, and also for sumi painting. And Mm -hmm. if I have the setup, I usually try to do some creative exercise with that setup as it's done so that, you know, when I move on to something else, then, um, you know, but I, I haven't really been painting as much in caustic in the last few years. Uh, Mm -hmm. it's just more cumbersome to do. Yeah. And you need more time. Exactly. You can't fit it into the little bits and pieces of time that you have as easily as you can, like just ink painting and. Right. Yeah. But I really do enjoy doing uh, a lot of the work on ceramics. Um, I love uh, painting dragons and I like, mm-hmm. uh, I love doing, um, I've been doing a lot of trout and, you know, kind of the stuff up here in, in Montana. And uh, so I really enjoy that creative process that gives me that sort of more artistic outlet Right. And, you know, my brushes are an artistic process because. Oh, absolutely. It's all the things go together, um, although it's a very functional product. So, Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I'm experimenting all the time because I would get so bored if all I was doing all the time was just by rote, you know, making another blade tool or. Yeah. The exact same brush right. size and shape over and over <laughs> yeah, again. Yeah, I just yeah. couldn't do it. I mean, I w- it would take the joy out of it. And yeah. um, it is a joy for me. I mean, I think about it 
even when I'm busy and, you know, I was a couple of days ago, I was like, damn, I, I'm, I'm burned out. Like I, I have had enough of this Christmas, <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, uh, but then I realized, you know, just had a good sleep, wake up the next day and I feel refreshed and I'm, I'm back at it again. And I just, you know, I just love it. So to, a long winded way to a- answer your question is that I don't have the time for more of the artistic expression in outside of brushes that I would like. Right. And I don't see that changing anytime soon because the demand that, that I have in, in this part of my business is really high. And, um, I really also really enjoy it. And it's, it's Mm -hmm. one of those funny things, you know, sometimes, uh, we start with something like uh, really working with an encaustic and then making that shift to something else can feel weird. Like, can I really do this? Is this okay? Yes. I mean, and um, I know that feeling well, but also exciting. Yes, for sure. Yeah. But it is, it is hard to make those switches. And then some people don't recognize maybe that it is an art practice still, you know, oh, right. you're a brush maker. Is that an art practice? I mean, most of my customers do appreciate it, but um, it's certainly not like a, a flat painting, you know, it's much different. So, but I get that too, even with my move in the last couple of years from doing encaustic mostly to doing digital art. Yeah. So, you know, all the stuff that I've been doing lately has been on my iPad and everybody's like, you know, well, is, are you going to get back to your real art? <laughs> <laughs> yes. People think it's fake art. I think we have to be careful not to let other people define yeah. who we are and what we are. You know, um, I do sometimes feel like I'm cheating on encaustic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and <laughs> It was funny because I got out my encaustic stuff and, and we, we have a little gallery in Big Fork that I have my work. And, um, you know, I, I, I did some paintings of the lake because where we live is so beautiful. It's so beautiful. Yeah, it's an, it's amazing. It's like waking up in a postcard every day. And I don't know why you would have left Dallas. Yeah. <laughs> Dallas or <laughs> yeah. how many times have I sent you a message saying, I'm so sorry you have to live in that ugly place. I know it's <laughs> it's fantastic. And, and so, you know, I feel very inspired by that. So I can also see where my art is going to go. Like, I have some things rolling around in my head and I don't know about you guys, but the way it works for me, especially when it comes to visual art is it rolls around in my head. It's there and it's, Mm -hmm. I'm tossing and turning it and I'm thinking about it and I have the vision and then, um, I just have to start work on getting it out. So I know that that desire is there and I'm certainly, um, bubbling up. Yeah. It's going to bubble. It's going to bubble up. And, you know, also at different parts of the year, it's going to be much quieter for me, probably starting in uh, February. So, mm-hmm. you know, then I'll have some time and I can spend some time doing some different kinds of art. And that's what I'll do is, is sort of shift some of my energy to those, that part of my art practice. But, you know, when you run an e-commerce store or a business, it's, it's demanding. Mm-hmm. I don't have any help. I do everything. You wear all the hats. Yes. And sometimes you know, some better than others because I'm not an expert in all this stuff, but I also don't want to pay somebody to do it for me. I was just going to ask if you've thought about getting an assistant to help with some of the, some of the maybe more repetitive things about making brushes. I've thought about it, but I just can't bear the thought of like, okay, well, how are they going to treat my bamboo handle? Like (laughs) I'm going to want it a certain way. And I'm also very good at it now. Like I'm pretty fast and can make certain things pretty fast. Um, So I'm not at the point of getting an assistant. I I think where I, if I was going to spend money on uh, having help, it would be more on the um, tech side of, you know, helping set up a more efficient Google ads and working to help me. um, I want to set up my product pages differently so that the photographs, I have to take a lot of photographs because, you know, nobody's going to spend $229 on a brush if there's three pictures. Right. I have to have a lot of pictures and it kind of yeah. mucks up my site a little bit. In the last few days, I was looking at, okay, is there an app I can get? You know, I'm on Shopify, by the way. So 
And, mm-hmm. and I would definitely highly recommend Shopify for anybody that wants to start an e-com store. It's a fantastic platform. Uh, it's very intuitive. It's easy to use. And if I, I would think that most people would be kind of doing these things sort of by themselves, you don't want to be locked into somebody that has to go do everything for you because then it's just too much time consuming and, and you have to be able to do it yourself, at least some of it, you know? Yeah. Maybe not the initial setup, but just the on, ongoing maintenance and yeah, things like definitely. that. Yeah. But I'm really starting to think of, you know, maybe trying to work with an agency on some of my advertising. It took me mm-hmm. a really long time to start advertising with Google, but I am advertising now on search with Google and also with shopping, you know, cause I really want to diversify my traffic and make sure right. that I have a good diverse base of traffic. That's not all coming from one area. I think um, for a long time I was overly dependent on Pinterest mm-hmm. and I, I don't want to have that in balance kind of, you know. And how do you do, how do you even get started with things like the, the Google advertising and you know, do you test it out and see what tests best or like, how do you, how do you even go about doing that? Well, I would say starting an e-commerce store is a marathon, not a sprint. And it takes a long time to build to where, you know, you can run it and run it profitably uh, without, you know, spending a bazillion dollars on paid traffic. And so the real key is to have a lot of good organic traffic. And I think once you have good organic traffic, And you have a website that has all the backlinks that you need and is, you know, Google's going to look at it and say, okay, this is a good website. And, um, you know, they have a blog, they have, you know, I mean, I have 5,000 backlinks on my, on my website with Google. That's impressive. (laughs) Um, and, and a while ago, I didn't even know what a backlink was, but I was listening to a podcast and he was talking about all the backlinks. I'm like, oh, I got to go check that out. And okay. I'm fessing up. I, I don't know what a backlink is. So you have to tell me what a backlink is. Well, I don't even know. <laughs> I think probably Nikki could explain it better than me. I don't even, I don't even totally understand it. But what I think it is, is like when I pin on Pinterest, there's a link that goes to my site. And when someone clicks on it, that's like a, a link to my site that's off of my site. So it backs into, is that right? Well, so a backlink is a link that is from another external site to your site. Right. So that would work because it's Pinterest. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So from Pinterest or from a blog or anybody that you've had review your site or there's all kinds of strange sites. Sometimes you can look at what these backlinks are through your analytics and you can see who's linking to you. Yep. And there's all these sites you've never heard of exactly. that just, they're kind of directory sites. And you're like, well, how did yeah. this website even find me? And I can't tell you how they do that, but- Robots? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, definitely, definitely. But um, but yeah, the more external links to your site, which are what backlinks are, the more it kind of makes your site seem reputable. Exactly. And so- Okay. Um, You know, I think there's a whole bunch of work that has to be done in advance. I I see a lot of people that, you know, start sites and they're like, oh, I'm not getting any traffic, so I'm going to do an ad. And that is just not the way to go, especially for Mm -hmm. handmade. Handmade, I think you really have to have organic traffic, although usually you have a better uh, margin. So you can kind of support, you know, some marketing activities a little bit better Mm -hmm. without too much worry. But it's not sustainable. You have to have organic traffic. So my recommendation to anybody looking to doing this is to start developing those, as I mentioned before, you know, your social media and also Mm -hmm. um, Pinterest, I think is a really good, really, really good resource for visual artists because it's such a visual site and um, Mm -hmm. that, that type of content really works well. And um, it's really done well for me. Pinterest is a great source of organic traffic, but then in terms of getting like really high quality backlinks, you can um, like exactly what you do with sending your products to people who are known in that medium is great. Yeah. So sending your tools to Paula Roland and Rebecca and, um, but also getting your site listed on well-known sites like, oh, if you can have a Wikipedia article that links to you or a a popular magazine website. Yeah, well, like uppercase. Uppercase, yes. They just listed me uh, 
like a month ago, I think, or something like that. But, you know, I have, I, I've been in articles and, and mm -hmm. the Kyoto Journal and, you know, just some things like that too. So um, especially for, like you mentioned, for Google, it's really important uh, yep. that your site is operating and it's it's got that type of stuff. And um, you can work with them too. They'll do stuff for free and help you. I've, I've worked with their support a number of different times to make sure that my tags were correct and, you know, helping me set up ads correctly and things like that. But you just have to ask for the help. And Ooh, note to self, get a Google ads person. Yes. On the podcast. Not someone who just runs Google ads for people, but someone from Google. Yeah. Good. Yeah. That would, that would be great. <laughs> that would be awesome. Google, are you listening? <laughs> <laughs> but but there are a lot of free resources. I mean, the other thing that I do a lot of is just listen to podcasts. Like I listen to a lot of marketing podcasts and mm -hmm. a lot of, um, I listen to a Pinterest podcast to make, you know, when I was first starting Pinterest, I did exactly what they'd said to do and it worked, mm -hmm. you know, it worked really well. So, you know, I, I think it's um, just really important to, recognize that it's a long process to, to really start to get a strong business developed online. And then obviously just the marketing part of it, make sure that your branding is really solid and consistent. Every single picture that I post for an item has my logo on it. And mm -hmm. if it gets reposted, then that logo's there. And yeah, it's just really important to have that and to make sure that, you know, you have good visual content, that your photographs are good. I mean, I try really hard to do good photographs. I don't always succeed with my lighting and stuff, but I really try. And th those things all make a difference too. And it's being intentional with everything that you post, you know, being very intentional with, yeah. with the brand that you're putting out in the world. I try. And also just consistency. You just have to do it. Like you talk to people and like, I don't really want to do it. And what if I post once every couple of weeks? Well, good luck with that because um, it's not going to work. <laughs> then maybe you'll get a sale once every couple of months. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it takes forever. I mean, Instagram has been trying to figure out how to get to, I'm like, I'm at 5,957 right now. It's like, I just want to get to 6,000. <laughs> it's like a slow slog up a, you know, just, oh my gosh, it just takes forever. At least you don't need 10,000 anymore to put a link in your stories. I yes. haven't figured out how to do that yet. I have to oh. look it up. I have to look it up. You guys mentioned it and I was like, oh, I got to look at that. And I still haven't been able to figure it out, but I, I will for sure. I'm happy to show you later, Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> I know it has to be pretty easy, but I just haven't, yeah, haven't gotten yeah. to that yet. So I have a little aside question. Uh, you were talking about how you have your logo on all your images. Talk to me about your logo. What does your mark represent? Oh, well, the, my logo is, it's a Chinese chop and uh -huh. it's, it's Elizabeth. That's what it says. Oh, cool. And it's an old, yeah, old style Mandarin. And I had the original chop. I'm a Chinese dragon, Zodiac dragon. Oh, so cool. I had the chop made in Hong Kong probably 18 years ago. Nice. And it has a nice really dragon carved into it. It's really cool looking. I see it. I'm looking at it right now. And yeah. we'll show it on our show notes page for sure. Awesome. And uh, I... I was using it in my encaustic paintings because, you know, you could heat mm -hmm. it up and it was just, yep. it looked cool and I liked it. And I just decided to use it as my logo for my business. And it really does say Elizabeth. I've had lots of people that speak Mandarin say Elizabeth. So I know it does <laughs> say that, um, but that's, that's my job. I've, it's a registered trademark um, that I registered and trademarked. So nobody can take it from me. And cool. I, I use it on all my marketing content pretty much. And it's just a really way, good way to have a very consistent visual identifier for my work. And especially if people steal my pictures and stuff like that, it's very easy for me. I mean, I'll maybe they can edit it out in Photoshop, but yeah. if they're going to just do a kind of a lowbrow steal, it's easy for me to, right. to recognize that. Say that it's yours. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Please stop using that image. It's not yours <laughs> to use. <laughs> so. Yeah, definitely. 
The other thing I love about this, this work, like your logo and um, your experience with your career so far, all the travel that you've done and how travel has kind of found its way through your career and your, your artwork and into your art world. So you started off with your corporate career going, you said you were in Taiwan and you did some work with Europe. And I can see all those influences of you traveling now into this career that you've built for yourself. Well, for sure. I mean, I, when I was younger, it was a dream of mine to travel. I mean, I wanted to go to Europe. I wanted to go to Asia. I wanted to go all these places and gosh, I never thought I would, but I ended up, gosh, I've been to almost, I, I lived in England um, and I traveled all over Europe and Southeast Asia and also broadly across the United States. So I, I love being in different cultures. I especially love the Asian culture. Uh, I love Taiwan. Taiwan is just a fantastic place to go and visit. And especially when you're able to spend a lot of time in a place like that, you really get to know it better. Mm -hmm. But I, I also lived in Malaysia as a child for almost four years. Oh, wow. And yeah, so I've always had an affinity for Asian culture. And, uh, that's just sort of permeated my life. And I, when I, when I worked in Asia, my, the people that worked for me, they told me I, they thought I had to be uh, Asian in a past life <laughs> because, <laughs> Could be. because I liked it so much. And, and, um, I don't know, I just had affinity for the culture and the people. Um, and, it's so true. These things permeate into what you do. And as we were just talking earlier, the place that I live now is permeating into what I do. Um, there's new materials, there's new handles, there's new feral material. I'm working with birch bark. I'm working with all this fabulous um, driftwood that we get out of the lake. And um, it just, it has a way of integrating and my work's always been about connections. It's always been about the connections in my life with people and places. So I think that's just a natural extension, um, being able to be in different places and have those experiences and then um, connecting those back to the things that you do in your everyday life. I, I think that's definitely something that's part of, of who I am as an artist. And and I have the same experience because I've traveled to 40 countries and Every time I've been to one of those places, it infuses, you know, it, it kind of gets embedded in your mind, but it comes out in other places, sometimes when you least expect it into your artwork. And, and to me provides a lot of meaning and opening eye, your eye to a world that's completely different than your own. Absolutely. Which is exciting and such a cool thing. I think you also in Taiwan, you probably have found all the hidden cool art shops. Oh my gosh. I know where all the art shops are <laughs> and the paper shops. I mean, the paper shops and the calligraphy shops. My favorite one has a whole huge downstairs area that's just paper and books. And, you know, I, I still have paper that I use all the time that I bought when I was there and I haven't been back in two years. So it's kind of like, I, I really do want to go back. I don't ever want to make that flight again. But um, <laughs> I do want to made that flight before that, yeah. that makes it difficult to go back. <laughs> I know I, I, you know, I've, having done it so many times, I mean, how long is that flight? Uh, 20 some odd hours total. Oh and my goodness. and yeah. the last company I worked for, it was all domestic travel. And, uh, you know, I was an executive platinum for a long time, a million mile flyer. Um, wow. But I lost my platinum status and they've changed all that. So I had to, you know, ride in the back and <laughs> now I have no status. And I, for so many years, I mean, you know, I worked traveling to you were Asia. Spoiled. I was totally spoiled. And the thought of getting on another flight in the back of the bus, I just, <laughs> I don't know. I just don't even know if I could do it, but I miss it. And I want to be there again. And I want to be, I want to go to the, the markets. I love all the sort of basic everyday things. Um, and when I travel, those are the things, I mean, obviously if you're in Europe and you're in Florence, I mean, you're going to want to go to the museums and do all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But for me, I, I am a traveler. I like to stay in a place kind of a long time. I like to see what it's like to live there and just mm -hmm. be part of 
that community for that short period of time. Yeah, um, t- that's how I like to travel too. Yeah. And I can say that one of my friends actually traveled with you to Taiwan. That's and right. And when, when she came back, she gave me a little treasure trove of like papers and brushes. <laughs> and now they weren't one of your brushes, Elizabeth. So <laughs> <laughs> well, you weren't to- that cool. You have to talk to her. We about have to that. fix that. Yeah. <laughs> but it was really, really cool. Um, and also, I don't know where you get these, but she brought back a felt, like this large black piece of felt that oh, you can work on. Yeah. And that is like one of my favorite art supplies that I own. I use it like every other day. What do you mean? What do you do with that? You paint you paint on them because the traditional Asian calligraphy is all done on a felted mat because you don't want the ink huh. to pool underneath the paper. The papers are really fine, thin papers that don't oh, have... Oh, so the ink yeah, soaks so through. The, the ink soaks through and then it soaks into the mat so that you don't get... Um, you know, you get clean lines and it, and it's, they're just really oh. nice. I'm looking over to my right and I have two of them sitting right on my table, but they are really, really nice. And, um, those are the things that you can get there along with great, you know, brushes. And, but I love the paper you can buy. You can just buy the, the most beautiful handmade paper and it's so good for encaustic monotype. I mean, it's just nice. smooth as butter and, um, I love working with it. But I do miss I do miss Taiwan um, a great deal, having spent, you know, three years of my life living there for half a month every month. I miss it. Wow. Yeah. Well, any day now we're going to have teleportation. (laughs) So we'll just get there instantly. Weren't we promised that by now? (laughs) And all the sci fi. (laughs) Yeah. Beam me up, Scotty. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Why don't we have that yet? Stargate. Does anybody know Stargate or am I the only geek in the room? (laughs) You're not the only geek in the room, Laura. And you're also aging yourself. I mean, I tried to watch that the other day and I realized how old that show is. I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe we watched this before. (laughs) Oh, I love Stargate. Laura's the youngest one in this room, I believe. (laughs) (laughs) I might be the oldest. I don't think so. I think I think I beat you on that. I don't know. We'll have we'll have to take that offline. Actually, yeah. I'm proud to admit my birthday was two days ago. Happy birthday. 54. Well, I'm 50. I think. Let me think. No, I'm 57. So my birthday was November. You got a couple of years on me, but not much. Just a couple. But we look fabulous. I, <laughs> I mean, you do. And I hopefully I look OK, too. <laughs> I said we. Okay. (laughs) We're all fabulous. Even the young ones in the room. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. (laughs) This has been fascinating learning how you, you know, got started without, you know, the art education. You've turned this into an amazing career. You got into brush making and you've done teaching, right? So you said you teach Zoom workshops and um, I know that you teach at the Dallas Encaustic Center as well. How did all that start? Well, it started with Bonnie because, you know, she knew, you know, my background, I did a lot of um, presenting in front of big crowds and public speaking and things like that. And I'm fairly good at articulating how to do things. Mm -hmm. I'm good at like, you know, if I'm teaching a workshop of explaining how to do a certain mark or use the tools. So when I was first doing my encaustic painting, it was, uh, I developed a lot of different methods myself because that's who I am. That's what, that's what I do. And, uh, <laughs> there was a lot of people that liked my work and it was unique. And, uh, she asked me if I wanted to come teach and gave me kind of a shot at it and, um, realized that I was good at it. And so for the last 10 years, we've been working together and every year I teach a monotype class, a uh, that I teach using a lot of the silicone tools. And then I also teach an encaustic workshop. And then I teach uh, in the flow, which is brush making ink and working large on paper. Um, I'm going to also teach two workshops up here in Montana. Cool. For brush making, spending some time out in nature. And ooh, when are you doing that? I am going to teach two workshops. One will be in the summer and one I want to do one in the fall. Because the fall here is so freaking beautiful. Oh, I bet. 
wasn't Legends of the Fall filmed there? It's all filmed in Montana, not in Big Fork, yeah. but it's, yeah, close, so close enough. So there are Legends of Fall in Montana. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. But it's really, really beautiful. And the lake, um, the, the Flathead Lakes is the biggest lake west of the Great Lakes, and it's 35 miles around and 50 miles across. And it, oh, wow. it is a super beautiful lake. Also, they start to let the lake level go down a little bit in the winter, um, and it creates a beach. And it's just a really beautiful place to go combing for wood and be out in nature. There's eagle nests, and it's just fabulous. So part of it will be um, doing a studio tour with me where I talk about the materials and have everybody at my studio in the morning. And then we'll go to the lake and walk down and look for materials and then spend, I I still haven't figured out exactly. It'll be a three or four day. I think I'm going to try to do a four day. Nice. And so we do one day of making brushes, one day of really painting and using painting large. I'll have bring large brushes for people to work on big, huge sheets of paper. And then the last day we really work on doing collage and mounting the work to panel. And so it's a, it's a really fun three day workshop or four day workshop, probably in July and either late September or early October of 2022. All right. I'm signing up for one of those because my bus will be ready for me to start traveling by the end of April. Well, there you go. So, I'm heading out there. Well, I will have, I'm going to have it set up on my website um, so people can sign up for the classes at that time. I have a lot of people interested already. So I'm nice. And it's such a beautiful destination. We're only 45 minutes from Glacier National Park. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, it's an incredible place. There's so much to do hiking. And I mean, I love to fish too. So if you like to go fishing, I think you should have an extra optional add on day. That's a fishing trip. We could, I mean, you know, there's so much you could do. (laughs) I mean, just take, just going out on the lake. The lake is, it's one of the cleanest lakes in the United States because it totally drains every two years because there's two huge rivers that flow right into it. So it's clear as glass, you know, it's amazing. It's really, really beautiful. So that's, that's my plan. I'll still teach with Bonnie. And then I'll do a couple of workshops up here. And my, my goal actually before COVID was to start developing some teaching in different areas in the U S different studios, but I never yeah. did it just because who wants to leave Montana well, because, of co- <laughs> because of COVID, but now, yeah, now it's like, it's so busy and I'm thinking, Hmm, do I really want to travel? But I really enjoy teaching. It's really enriching to spend time with artists and to work with people, to show them how to make different things and to just really explore their own creativity. Um, so I really mm-hmm. enjoy that a lot and will continue doing it for sure. And I, and I also really like doing Zoom. I, I have a really good setup. I have good lighting, you know, good microphone, camera. And so it's nice and clear and I, I work with artists and they can sit in their own home and uh, spend time with them. Yeah. And it's been really great. And I really enjoy doing that. Yeah. Laura teaches that way too. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's really, it's really good. And uh, that part of my uh, teaching has been growing and uh, I've been enjoying that a lot. Awesome. So I hate to do this, but it's time to start thinking about wrapping up. So we have a couple questions we want to make sure that we get in. And the first one is, what question should we have asked you that we didn't? Um, well, I don't know if there's a should or, you know, the should question, <laughs> but I think. <laughs> but what, what opportunity did we miss out on? Um, I think maybe just talking a little bit more about uh working on the website for those people that really want to try to branch out, um, get outside of Etsy and do their own thing. One of the key things I think I would ask is what are those most important things to work on? If you want an e-com site. And I had written on my notes like that email list, boy, you better get your email list together. Don't discount your email list. My email list is incredibly important. And, um, you know, those type of things. I think that would be helpful for those folks that, you know, want to get their business going for sure. Yeah. And we actually are going to, we're planning a whole series on artist websites and 
including email marketing in that. So definitely we will, we will add some of that. And just general marketing, like how do you market? Like what is it Mm -hmm. that you do and how do you generate traffic? Like what are you Mm -hmm. specifically doing to generate traffic? Because without traffic, you have nothing and you cannot pay for traffic, at least all of it. Right. You know, so I think that is really, really critical too, is to, to crack that nut of, uh, just getting people interested in what you're doing and coming to your site and what tools are available for that. Yeah. And that kind of flows into our next question, which is what one piece of advice would you give to someone who's just getting started? I would say to just get started, like start. (laughs) Um, Yeah. That's our main message for sure. (laughs) I mean, so many people get stuck and just, Oh, if I do, I can't do that. I don't know how to do that. I didn't know how to make a Mm -hmm. website. I didn't know how to use Shopify. In fact, just yesterday I realized I had clicked a box in one of my promotions and then my promotion didn't work correctly. So I had to go and my customer, I was talking to them on the phone and they're like, Oh, this didn't work right. And I was like, Oh, let me go look. And I just realized, Oh, there's just, I had to click that little thing. That'll never happen again. Little box, And I'll never do it again, (laughs) but I made that little mistake. But don't be afraid of making mistakes, take risks and start. Yep. And it doesn't matter if you don't know, there is podcasts on every single subject you could ever listen to your own podcast. You guys <laughs> offer a lot of good information. I listen to all of it and I'm pretty well versed on a lot of these things. And I still, there's just little snippets that you get. I, I don't know if it was on your podcast or not, but the person who said, um, every time you sell something, or buy something off the internet, take that receipt that you get from that purchase and stick it in a purchase folder on your email. And I was like, oh gosh, that's such a good idea for taxes, you know? (laughs) And so it's just one little thing that you can learn from it, but yeah. And listen to figure out if you don't know what SEO is, then go listen to some podcasts on it and just proactively educate yourself and take those steps that you need. And there's, you don't have to pay there's very little that you actually have to pay for. There's a lot of free resources. And, um, you know, like I said, just, just start and take risks and put yourself out there and you'll get better and you'll figure it out over time. And then don't be all over the place. Like try to pick a lane and (laughs) and stick to it. I'm not very good at picking a lane. (laughs) All the lanes all the time. (laughs) <laughs> Elizabeth, where can our listeners find you online? Well, they can find me at my website, which is elizabethschwackertart.com. I have, that's the one stop place you can go to find me. And uh, I have all my contact information on there. And you sign up for my newsletter. I give all my subscribers special deals that everybody else doesn't get. And I believe you are going to offer something special for our listeners I am. who go to your website. I will offer all of your listeners a, a one-time coupon of 20% off their purchase. And it's Stardust, all capital, 20. Um, and for sure, I would love to do that for your listeners to your fabulous podcast. Thank you, Elizabeth. That is so, so generous. And we will have a link to that in our show notes. So you can find it there. You don't have to remember it. That's fabulous. <laughs> and they don't have to try to well, spell thanks. my name. So. And they don't have to try to spell your name. They don't even have to try to say it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you guys did great. So there's no problem at all. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so, so much for being here. It's been great. And I'm going to come take your class in, um, in Montana. Well, I would love that. And I really appreciate it. <laughs> you know, I know that uh, art podcasts, the people listening to those co- podcasts are my customers. And Absolutely. one of my goals this year was to do a couple podcasts. And I, uh, I reached out to several people and look what happened. You know, I, look what happened. Yeah. I got to be on your fabulous podcast and I'm, I'm really uh, happy about that. It was, it's been a pleasure. Awesome. But that's also a great piece of advice is don't be afraid to ask for something. Exactly. You have to ask it, nothing, nothing is going to just suddenly appear out of thin air and, you know, suddenly all, all the things in life are answered. I mean, it's just a process and there's lots of no's and then there's a few yeses and then there's a lot of mistakes and I have a terrible time writing content and do, I mean, there's so many things that I don't do well, but 
you just have to keep plugging along and eventually things can come around, especially if you're really dedicated and enthusiastic about what you're doing and you have passion and people see that and they, they reward that for sure. To learn more about Elizabeth and read today's Start a Society show notes, go to startasociety.com. And don't forget, Elizabeth has generously offered our listeners a great discount. You can use the code STARTUS20 for a one-time use coupon of 20% off anything in her shop. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next week.